On this week in Enterprise Tech, we have Mr. Brian Chi and Mr. Curtis Franklin back on the show. Is burnout inevitable for IT pros and cybersecurity professionals? Well, organizations need to figure out how to curb some of that stress. So we're going to talk about some ways. Plus, Jason McGee, GM and Chief Technology Officer of IBM Cloud Platform is here today. And we're going to talk about hybrid clouds and just how might that might be the solution for hyperscale, performance, compliance, and portability. You definitely shouldn't miss it. Quiet on the set. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Twit. This Week in Enterprise Tech, episode 547, recorded June 9th, 2023. DroolCon 5. This episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by Decisions. Don't let complexity block your company's growth. Decisions rules-driven process automation software allows you to manage a complex digital landscape. Build custom workflows, business rules software, modernize legacy systems, and improve customer experiences in Decisions' unified, no-code platform. Visit decisions.com slash twit to learn how automating anything can change everything. And by ZipRecruiter. Did you know that hiring can take up to 11 weeks on average? Do you have that time to wait? Of course not. Stop waiting and start using Zip Recruiter. Zip Recruiter helps you find qualified candidates for all of your roles fast. And right now, you try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash Twyatt. Welcome to this week in Enterprise Tech, the show that is dedicated to you, the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and that geek who just wants to know how this world is connected. I'm your host, Louis Moresca, your guys with the big world of the enterprise, but I can't guide you by myself. I need to bring in the professionals and the experts in their field, starting our very own principal analyst at Andia. He's Mr. Curtis Franklin, the man who's got the pulse on the enterprise. Curtis, you're, uh, you're heading to Sin City pretty soon, aren't you? I will be. Uh, about a month from now, I'll be heading out there, going to uh, be visiting with a vendor, uh, so that's uh, a major uh, conference. And then about three weeks later, I'm back out there for the Black Cat DEF CON duo. I'm going to be doing both of those. Uh, next week, I'm going to spend a day at Infocom here in Orlando. So getting out and amongst the industry, it's uh, a good thing to do to be talking to people, finding out new things. Uh, I'm excited about some of the stuff coming up, have lots more to say. But I think I'll wait until the end of the program. So we're going to give people a reason to hang around to find out what's going on. Cliffhanger, cliffhanger. Well, thank you, Curtis, for being here. Always great to have you. We also have to welcome back our network geek, Mr. Brian Chi. He's always cooking up something. And I'm always interested to hear about it. Kurt, uh, Chibert, what's going on this week for you? Actually, I'm um, doing Science Night Live at the Orlando Science Center. Uh, as part of the MakerFX Makerspace. Uh, and I also will be spending a day or two at Infocom meeting with a bunch of different people because I'm looking at digital signage and projection technologies for possible inclusion at the Central Florida Fairgrounds. Ought to be a lot of fun. And you know what? I'm also learning about... Ta-da... Raman spectroscopy, Ooh. how to um, detect chemical makeups of materials at a distance. We are getting very, very close to having production devices that are very equivalent to the Star Trek tricorder. Well, thank you again for being here, Brian. We should definitely get started. Is burnout inevitable for IT pros and cybersecurity professionals? Well, we need to give some organizational ways for them to curb their stress. We're going to talk about some of those ways. Plus, Jason McGee, GM and CTO of IBM Cloud Platform, is going to talk about hybrid clouds and just how it might be your solution for hyperscale performance and compliance. So definitely stick around. Lots to talk about there. But before we do, let's go ahead and jump into this week's news blips. According to an internal memo recorded and reported by Quartz and The Verge, Google is tightening up its hybrid work policy with employees now expected to attend the office at least three days a week. 
that those that are actually adhering to this schedule could face consequences in their performance reviews. Google plans to track office attendance through badge data and workers consistently absent from the office may receive those nasty grams from their teams. Now, Google's chief people officer has urged even remote workers who live near a Google office to consider switching to a hybrid work schedule, stressing the importance of in-person collaboration. Now, that's an opinion backed by Pew Research Center's finding that over half of Americans who work from home feel less connected to their coworkers. Now, this stance is noteworthy given that these same tech companies who are moving to a hybrid policy have also been the creators and promoters of remote work tools such as Google Docs and Slack, which have revolutionized global remote work. Now, despite Google's earlier plans to allow 20% of its force to telecommute, the policy change underscores the tech giant's commitment to maintaining physical office presence amid an increasingly competitive artificial intelligence landscape. Now, Google's hybrid work approach aims to balance the benefits of remote and in-office work while addressing those concerns about adherence to the policy. Now, we hear about the new norm all the time, right? Well, the world is made up of people of all kinds in all situations, and some need more connection than others. Now, Google's looking to try and force everyone down that same path. The question is, what do you think about that? Well, once in a while, we get a chance to look inside a criminal gang's operations and be unpleasantly surprised by just how disciplined and professional they can be. This week, that looks comes courtesy of an article at Dark Reading describing how the CIOP or the PSYOP gang sat on a vulnerability for nearly two years before they unleashed it to a devastating effect. Now, here at Twyatt, we've talked before about just how valuable zero-day exploits can be, and this case show why that's true. PSYOP found a zero-day vulnerability in Progress Software's Move It transfer file, transfer app, and then spent two years in which it periodically launched waves of malicious activity against vulnerable systems to test their access to organizations and identify the ones to target. Researchers at Kroll Threat Intelligence, who investigated the recent attacks, found evidence showing PSYOP actors experimented with ways to exploit the move it transfer vulnerability as far back as July 2021. The telemetry suggests the threat actors were testing access with vulnerable move it transfer clients and attempting to retrieve information that could help them identify the organizations where it was installed. Starting in April 2022, PSYOP actors upped their technology game, started using an automated mechanism for probing and collecting information from multiple organizations at the same time. The group wasn't focusing all their attention on MoveIt, though, because they have a pattern of finding vulnerabilities in file transfer programs and exploiting them for profit. Now, in this new case, PSYOP, which is also tracked as LACE Tempest and is known to be part of the TA505 threat group, came out of stealth on June 1st. So far, the list of known victims has included the BBC, British Airways, and the government of Nova Scotia, while PSYOP itself has claimed hundreds of victims. On June 7th, CISA issued a warning based on the serious nature of the attacks, the devastating nature of the vulnerability, and the speed with which the campaign has spread. Move It, if you don't know, is a managed file transfer app that thousands of organizations, including giants like Disney, Chase, Geico, and various U.S. federal agencies, use to transfer sensitive data and large files. Now, because this was a true zero day, there is no patch or remediation yet. So if your organization is one of those using Move It, well, it's time to seriously up your vigilance and make sure that your backup and business continuity plans are world class because the odds are better than even you're going to need them. All right. So heads up, this is not an enterprise news story. Sorry about that. This is more of a public service announcement because I've, you know, up until I retired, I was living in Hawaii, and this is something we kept hearing over and over and over again. So the Kilauea volcano on the Big Island of Hawaii is erupting again and again and again. So Hawaii was formed by volcanoes, and 
the hot spot is currently under the Big Island of Hawaii. Kilauea, in one form or another, has actually been erupting on and off, uh, but mostly on, since 1984 when a cinder cone emerged in a banana farmer's field. Kurt and his family have actually stayed at the Volcano House Hotel right on the crater rim to join luminaries like Mark Twain who have stayed there. Chebert has actually walked across the crater floor to place environmental sensors, which are oh, now kind of part of the lava, sorry. So my favorite sign on the Volcano Rim was the old BC Caveman comic, and it went this way. See Dick and Jane vacation in Hawaii. See Dick and Jane taking the volcanoes. See Dick and Jane get too close to the edge. See the volcano taking Dick and Jane. Well, for those of you that wish to take in the volcanoes, please be aware that wading into the surf where lava pours into the sea has already parboiled a tourist. Going beyond the ropes lost a tourist his legs when he broke through the lava crust and fell into the lava flow. A woman suffocated because she was asthmatic and parked her car right under a sign at the sulfur banks that warned people with breathing issues they should exit the area because the sulfur bank really is spewing sulfur. So please enjoy the scenery and the natural beauty of Hawaii, but heed the warning signs. Oh yeah, Hawaii is made of basalt and it's very crumbly. The county fire rescues had to pick up a multitude of very experienced rock climbers off razor thin mountain peaks because handholds have crumbled out from under their fingers. Many people have described Hawaii as being the most different place you can go and still stay in the United States. It is a very different culture made up of a very large number of other cultures. My family lived there when it was still the kingdom of Hawaii. Have a great time, but be sensitive to just how different it is from your home state. U.S. Senators have launched two bipartisan artificial intelligence bills to address AI technology rapid advancement and implications. According to Reuters, this move comes in light of AI's transformative potential highlighted by the release of ChatGPT and the market infusion it has had over the last several months. Now, the first bill, proposed by Senators Gary Peters, Mike Braun, and James Lankford, mandates transparency when government agencies use AI to interact with the public. Additionally, it stresses the need for a human centric approach in AI decision-making processes, ensuring humans remain at the helm of control. Now, this legislation also brings and asks for a way to appeal decisions made by AI, giving citizens a voice in AI governance. On the other hand, Senators Michael Bennett, Mark Warner and Todd Young introduced a bill to set up a Office of Global Competition Analysis. Now, the goal of this is actually keep America at the forefront of AI development and retain its competitive edge against global players like China and strategic technologies like AI, quantum computing, and semiconductors. To keep lawmakers up to speed with AI advancements, Senator Majority Leader Chuck Schumer has planned three AI briefings, one of which will be the first ever classified briefing on the topic. Now, these sessions will discuss the AI overview strategies for American leadership in AI and classified meaning focusing on defense and intelligence implications. Schumer has been proactive about framing rules on AI to tackle national security and education issues, especially with the advent of programs like ChatGPT, which has over 100 million active users, monthly active users now. However, getting these rules approved by Congress and the White House could take several months, maybe even several years, marking a significant step forward towards new regulations for generative AI. Well, folks, that does it for the news blips. Next up, we have the news bites. But before we get to the news bites, we do have to thank a really great sponsor of this week in Enterprise Tech, and that's decisions. Now, in today's digital landscape, businesses are faced with an overwhelming number of tools and systems that are necessary to operate effectively. Well, by managing all of those disparate tools, and ensuring they work together seamlessly can really be a daunting task for any team. Now, this is where Decisions comes in. Decisions serves as the ultimate orchestrator for IT and industry experts, providing a unified platform for businesses to manage their digital infrastructure. By automating routine tasks and customizing workflows, Decisions helps businesses reduce operational costs, improve customer service, and streamline their overall processes. In a constantly evolving digital landscape where innovations happen on the fringe, adaptability is crucial to staying ahead of the game. Using a powerful 
no-code platform, Decisions allows both developers and business users to build applications and those automations without a single line of code. Now, with Decisions, your team can collaborate to build and adjust workflows, dynamic forms, and decision-making processes that fit your unique and ever-changing business needs. Decisions features a robust set of rules and a workflow engine and pre-built integrations that connect to any legacy system via API. And all of this is controlled within a single drag and drop visual interface designer. Here's one great example of how Decisions Automation software can actually help. Knowledger manages portfolios and investment activity for family accounting offices and investment firms, and they faced a challenge in managing their complicated digital landscape. Decisions provided complete system integration, which allowed Knowledger to pull data from any database and communicate with every system and application in their process. This enabled a pain-free solution to managing their portfolios, streamlining operations, and improving their customer service and customer experience to keep ahead in the financial industry. Automating the small decisions frees up valuable time for your team to focus on bigger decisions that matter to your business. Now, with decisions, you can customize workflows, automate routine tasks, and reduce those operational costs while better serving your customers. Managing a fragmented digital landscape is essential for businesses to remain competitive and successful. Decisions offer a powerful no-code solution that unifies business practices and makes managing your digital landscape easier than ever before. Discover the power of decisions today by claiming your free demo at decisions.com slash twit. In today's ever-changing digital landscape, managing the numerous tools and systems businesses need to operate can be a hurdle to growth and efficiency. Decisions no-code automation software simplifies the complexity of managing multiple systems, allowing businesses to unify their operations, reduce their operational costs, and drive company growth. To learn more about Decisions no-code automation platform and claim your free demo, visit decisions.com slash twit. That's decisions.com slash twit. And we thank Decisions for their support of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, it's time for the news bites. And this one's a pretty good one because in the, in the rapidly changing digital world, uh, you know, a lot of cybersecurity professionals out there are working tirelessly to keep us safe, to keep their organization safe from cyber attacks, right? Well, constant vigilance has a downside as well. The threat of burnout among these essential workers is real. It's real. The industry is a defensive marathon. If you think about it, it's not a sprint regarding cybersecurity. However, not everyone in this marathon is a marathon runner. So job stress is always a constant companion as, as the fallout from breaches or ransomware attacks can be immediate and damaging. It really cause some problems, but there's hope on the horizon. Tech leaders can implement strategic and strategizing ways to reduce daily stress and prevent burnout. Now, the first step, simplicity. The rush of digital transformation has left us with a lot of complex systems. I know. I have some of them, sometimes incompatible and increasing the risk of cyber attacks. Now, we need to get back to the basics, identify critical business services, move them to the cloud if possible, build security and resilience around them and aim for really integrated and interoperable infrastructures. And through that, it's not new to think about this, but tools like patching and vulnerability management solutions can really simplify our systems and secure our systems. So definitely think about that. Resilience is the second part of this equation. Now, as they say, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Let's not let's not wait there, right? Let's actually start the event of happening and building out our infrastructure. Let's plan, prepare, and practice. Write down the incident response plans and make sure that they're accessible even offline. Regularly practice them, go through the flow, use that recovery automation when it's possible, and protect common targets like Active Directory in your databases. The tools like Cyber, Cyber Vaults actually could help organizations recover faster from attacks. Now, one thing organizations do forget is that cybersecurity is a shared responsibility. That's right. It's all, all hands on deck and it shouldn't rest solely on the shoulders of the security teams. Now, the C-suite should be actively involved. They should regularly be updating and testing business continuity and recovery plans. They should be conducting, conducting risk assessments out there and ensuring recovery time and recovery point objectives are met. Now, there's that whole concept of secure by design culture. And that's right. It's, it's crucial. Crucial. Security must not be an afterthought. It must be an integral part of your software architecture, your services, and even your networks. And only by empowering all those security professionals in your group and prioritizing the well-being can really help prevent burnout. So I want to bring my co-host in. There's lots of great stuff in this article, and I think it points out some interesting things. 
you know, obviously it's saying that, you know, Curtis, I want to go to you first because it's saying that being informed and being trained and using automation and tools should relieve some of this stress. Is, is it enough, you think? Well, obviously, if you are comfortable with your skill set, if you don't feel like you're in over your head all the time, that's going to reduce some of your stress. <clears throat> but let's remember that one of the key sources of stress is what's known as an alert overload. In other words, a lot of people, especially in security, are in a situation where they get so many security alerts that they're just overwhelmed. It, it's like being faced with the army of fast zombies from World War Z coming at you all the time. And that's highly stressful. Uh, there are a lot of ways in which we can deal with this, and companies are trying to deal with it. They range from the brutally simple, like add more people, to the more sophisticated, as you said, changing architectures to make them secure by design. Um, and those are all important. We are seeing AI being used in different, different ways to help people, both by automating some of the basic activities and by providing uh, more help, that, that helpful, knowledgeable friend who can suggest things to you. Uh, but you mentioned one thing that I think is unlikely to happen, and that is making our systems simpler. Uh, we all know that complexity is the enemy of security. And yet the standard enterprise architecture today is phenomenally complex, involving not just the cloud, which is complex in itself, but cloud software as a service, on-prem, uh, hosted, all thrown together in ways where it can be difficult to track logic flows and data flows. And let's not forget that too many times these little bits and bytes are flowing through multiple jurisdictions, which adds its own level of stress and complexity. So I think the more we can do to design insecurity and the more we can do to augment the intelligence and expertise of our human uh, security workers, uh, the less likely we are to have people sitting in the corner, uh, gently drooling into their DEF CON coffee mugs. That's going to be a show title, I think. But uh, I think you definitely, I definitely like to cut the call out of complexity because that is a true factor. In fact, we'll probably get into that when we bring our guest in to talk a little bit more about the concept of hybrid clouds and maybe how people can reduce some of that complexity. But Chibert, I want to bring you in because, you know, there's a call out here, especially in this article about the fact that obviously it's just not one a one person job here, right? It's all hands on deck. What, what can be what can be done to ensure that? Well, uh, my I'm going to just throw out an example. I I've been in one firm or another on call since I was 17, 16, 17 years old. Um, I was actually a programmer for a company that was doing. Uh, guidance, maintenance, and all kinds of stuff for a, <clears throat> a missile system, <laughs> which was an interesting thing for a high school kid. Um, but one of the things they did was they recognized very, very early, this is back in the mid-70s, that um, people on call burn out really, really fast um, if they think the entire world is dependent upon them, you know, if something happens. So one of the things they tried to, uh, with some success was everybody got a pager. Um, everybody was on call, but they would scramble who got the pager that uh, would get called. Now, the whole idea behind this was to reduce the alert Um I guess I guess the term would be um, fatigue. And so each person um, in the division kind of knew what the other people did. So the person that actually did get the call would then field the call and say, okay, we need to actually talk to this person. Um, instead of everybody getting a call saying, oh my God, everything's broke, um, when it only needed to be one person. Now, 
if we take this, obviously nobody uses pages anymore. Um, but it does do something interesting. The alert fatigue is a very, very real thing. And having everybody involved uh, so that the team helps sort who, who actually deals with the um, issue goes a long way towards a concept I call buy-in. Everybody wants to be part of the team, no matter how small. So I could easily see even, you know, I wouldn't say secretarial staff, but um, admin help, helping to sort out what's going on. Um, maybe it's a script they have to go through, you know, just ask the script, but it kind of gives you the chance to, you know, deal with things and relieve some of the stress on the rest of the team. You know, maybe some, maybe even a, um, oh heck, I'd even go as far as saying, you know, maybe, maybe someone that does the um, filing, you know, the classified filing or the um, sensitive filing, but still knows what's going on in the team might be a good person to also be on call once in a while. So it's, I'm stretching a little bit and I, I can definitely see there's going to be all kinds of interesting comments out of the chat room, but uh, buy-in, you know, making sure everybody feels like they're part of the team um, is a, what I think a pretty good thing. You know, when someone feels like they haven't, um, they have no way of directing how things go in the team is stressful in itself. And cybersecurity is definitely something that <clears throat> while we have experts, um, the chances of a corporation having a, an entire team of experts is going to be probably pretty slim. And it's, there's probably going to be within that team people that have specialties. And I think having, you know, some crib notes so that no matter who you are in the team, you know who to direct it to might not be a bad idea. That's my two cents. Totally agree. Totally agree. Now, I, I, Curtis, I want to ask you one other question because I think that, you know, obviously there's this whole concept of generative AI. It's coming out. There's lots of organizations integrating it. And I'm hearing and actually seeing some examples from organizations where they're using it in the case to help reduce some of the burnout, some of the, some of the challenges they have today, whether it's, you know, ingesting streams of data to be able to determine whether there's alerts or not or you may, you know constructing entities out of that data and, and building actual physical alerts for that kind of thing is is this going to help with with burnout is this is this you're seeing some examples where this is actually going to make some some strides i think generative ai could be a help um over the intermediate to long term it's not going to be a great help next week and the the reasons are are multiple one of them is that generative ai is not yet sufficiently trustworthy to be used in mission critical situations. Uh, you still have to verify what you're getting from it. Another is that none of the people I know of in the security industry are talking about using generative AI as an automation device. They're not talking about using it to replace individuals, but to augment the effort of individuals. And in order to make that happen correctly and make it happen to best effect, the human analyst, the human staff is going to have to learn how to work with generative AI. That means upskilling, and that means some short-term added stress. Uh, I think that the goal is going to be worth getting there. I think it can be a valuable tool. But I also think that anybody explain, uh, expecting it to solve the burnout problem by Labor Day is going to be bitterly disappointed. I agree. I, agree. Well, I think with that, we we'll put that one to bed. We should definitely get moving because we want to get to our guests to drop some knowledge on the twilight, right? Before we get there, we do have to thank another great sponsor of this week in Enterprise Tech. And that's Zip Recruiter. Now, did you know they can take up to 11 weeks? That's a long time on average to hire for an open position. Now, that's almost two and a half months. So if you're hiring for a growing business, do you really have the time to wait? Well, if you're listening today. I've got some advice for you. Stop waiting and start using Zip Recruiter. Zip Recruiter can help you find qualified candidates for all your roles, 
fast. And right now, you can try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash Twyatt. Check that out. ZipRecruiter.com slash Twyatt. Now, how efficient is ZipRecruiter in helping you hire? Well, ZipRecruiter uses powerful matching technology to quickly find you and send you the most qualified people for your roles. You can check out the people that ZipRecruiter sends you. And if you really like one or two, you can personally invite them to apply with one click, which actually make them apply even sooner. Plus, here's how quickly ZipRecruiter can work to help you hire. Four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. Speed up your hiring process with ZipRecruiter. See why 3.8 million businesses have come to ZipRecruiter for their hiring needs. Just go to their exclusive web address to try ZipRecruiter for free. ZipRecruiter.com slash twy. Again, that's ZipRecruiter dot com slash t w i e t zip recruiter the smartest way to hire and we thank zip recruiter for their support of this week in enterprise tech well folks it's my favorite part of the show we actually get to bring in a guest to drop some knowledge on the twilight riot and today we have jason mcgee he's chief technology officer and gm of ibm cloud platform welcome to the show jason hey thanks for having me glad to be here Absolutely. Now, our audience is a complete spectrum of experience levels, and they love to hear people's origin stories. Can you take us through a journey through tech and what brought you to uh, IBM? Sure. Yeah, I've uh, I've actually been at IBM for a very long time, for uh, 26 years. Um, so my my origin story goes back quite a ways. Um, but really, I've spent my whole career as an engineer building platforms for enterprises to run their applications. And, you know, 20 some odd years ago, that was Java and application servers and and that whole space. Uh, and over the years, spent lots of time in in virtualization and and really thinking about how how companies, you know, build their applications and how we can keep them focused on, you know, what real business problem they're solving, less on security and less on scaling and, and resiliency and performance. And, uh, and nowadays I run IBM's public cloud and, and drive our public cloud strategy and some of our hybrid technologies, which I think is just the, the modern version of application platforms. Now, we, we talked a little bit about complexity, right? We, we talked a little about, um, you know, environment complexity and organizational complexity. You know, obviously, we want to get into talking about hybrid cloud. What are some of the biggest challenges organizations are facing when they are trying to adopt the hybrid cloud strategy? Yeah, I, I mean, I think the challenges vary a lot. I mean, there's some of the basic ones you guys touched on, like, uh, especially in an enterprise environment, uh, security, vulnerability, um, performance and scalability, regulation, um, and being able to meet all the kind of evolving regulation. You guys mentioned generative AI. I think that's going to generate a whole interesting set of discussions about evolving regulations and data, data security. So th there's those things. Um, I think uh, their existing IT environment is a, a, a area for complexity. You know, most of these customers have you know, on-prem systems, many technologies spread over many generations and and having the skill to figure out how to use technologies like hybrid cloud to move them forward is a challenge. Um, even just skills of their employees, right? And, and evolving knowledge uh, for their employee base is a challenge. So there, there's many things I think are driving complexity um, and, and uh, have to be solved to be able to really get the value out of technologies like cloud. So when, if you have an organization comes to you and they're saying, hey, we have a complex um, environment, we want to move and we want to adopt a hybrid cloud strategy, what are, what are some advice that you would give them as they get started, as they get moving to that space? Yeah, I think first, you know, you're, you're touching on hybrid. And I think when you talk about hybrid, you know, the idea of hybrid cloud is um, that your workloads are going to live in multiple places. You know, you, you have on-prem data centers, you have public clouds, you probably have more than one public cloud provider that you're working with. Um, maybe you exist in multiple countries around the world. So you have, you know, geographic requirements. And so I think one of the first things I ask is like, what's the workload? Like, what is the application? What's the data that you're trying to deal with and move to cloud or evolve? Um, and what are some of the requirements around that application? Because that will really control what technologies you use, where you run it, 
you know, um, and uh, and how you leverage the cloud to, you know, either build that new application or to move that existing application into a cloud environment. So what about you bring up a good point? Obviously, the whole architecture of hybrid cloud could sometimes be a, a black hole for people or they, you know, it's a black box, I guess mm-hmm. you could say. What are some pretty good or most promising use cases for when you want a, a hybrid cloud or even hybrid cloud storage scenarios? Yeah, there's a there's a lot, but I'll try to boil it down to maybe two big drivers that I see for for hybrid. And when and and I think the drivers around hybrid are really fundamentally about kind of where does the application need to run. One driver is um, security and compliance, uh, and the other driver is data latency and data volumes. So like security and compliance could be I'm a bank and the regulations say the data for my customers have to live in a certain country or a certain geography and I have to maintain control over that data and control over who can access it and use it. So regulation might dictate where the application runs and where the data runs and that will dictate whether it moves to a cloud provider or you know stays in your data center or something like that. Um, the data example could be Think about like um, IoT, um, you know, new data being generated by sensors or think about AI applied to video data. Like you have use cases where you're generating a lot of information or processing a lot of information. It's more efficient to kind of move the application to wherever the data is coming from uh, instead of moving all the data into cloud, right, Uh, or into another environment. So like being close to data and being close to where data is generated can be a big driver. And I think Lots of scenarios ultimately boil down to some flavor of those two things. All right, well, a lot of motivation behind moving hybrid scenarios is obviously get out outside of maybe cloud lock in, um, mm-hmm. but also a lot of people's you know pushback from moving there many years ago is the fact that they're worried about performance and the fact that they have to kind of have these these pipelines between the different clouds. What, what have you seen maybe yeah. in like hybrid cloud scenarios? How, how has it evolved over the last several years? I think it's evolved in a kind of an interesting way um, in the sense that first off, people, I think, acknowledge now that they're going to have a diverse set of environments. If you if you go back five or six years in the cloud conversation in the industry, it was kind of very simplistic. You know, I'm going to move all my workload to cloud and close all my data centers. Right. Um, That's not really the reality today. And I think most people acknowledge that um, and recognize it, which means you're going to have a mix of environments that are connected together. Um, and, and therefore you have to be a little bit more mature about thinking about how you want to leverage, uh, you know, leverage cloud environments. So I think that's a big uh, driver is just acknowledging um, the architectures um, that, you know, really exist today and, and being able to have a strategy about how you deal with them. So now that we've kind of talked about the general case, what, what are you seeing? How, how is hybrid, some of the high, hybrid cloud solutions by IBM Cloud or even Wasabi Hot Cloud Storage, how are they going to help? Yeah, so so um, one interesting, let's say, use case for hybrid cloud that's come up in a few places and, and is represented in, in a particular partnership that we can talk about is, um, is in sports and entertainment. Um, and if you think about sporting events, um, they... They're very localized, right? Like they happen somewhere. Data is being generated at the event. They're live. They're high scale. Um, they happen somewhere. So, for example, we we had a partnership with uh, the Boston Red Sox with and a partner of ours called Wasabi that was about um, being able to store and process data um, at at Fenway Park at the Red Sox. So, think about an event like that. You're you know, if you wanted to um, collect data from the stadium, if you wanted to do AI analytics on live video feeds from the from the games themselves, you probably want to be able to do that actually close to where the event is happening. And so being able to move the workload into uh, into the ballpark, for example, becomes really compelling. And I think uh, the solutions that we have in IBM Cloud, like we have a technology called IBM Cloud Satellite, uh, which lets you kind of take the public cloud experience and extend it out into any infrastructure that you want. And I think that's the other big transition that's in flight right now in the industry is everyone has kind of agreed that the cloud operating model, like this idea of APIs and self-service and pay for what you use and somebody runs the service for you, like everyone likes that model, but they want to be able to apply that model more broadly to all of the places they need to run. And so like in this Boston Red Sox example, they 
it can have kind of all of the public cloud services, but run them in Fenway Park, keep their data local, process all the information locally, store their data in an object store, which is where Wasabi came into the picture, uh, and be able to kind of have that full cloud experience, but control where the information was. We, we, we talked about a couple episodes ago, I think it was 543, uh, about a company called Medify, and they were talking about bringing you know, bare metal solutions like Kubernetes closer to the park so that they can run it yeah. directly at the park to kind of reduce latency and that kind of thing. So when we talk a little bit about the solution you were you were mentioning, you know, what, what are some of the benefits of not having to be, you know, directly at the location and having this more hybrid scenario? Is compliance maybe? It could be like we had another example where this technology was used in in Germany in a in the a hospital network in Germany called called Minds Hospital. So it's a university hospital network. Um, and their use case was more driven by that security and compliance thing. They needed to build new applications to do like uh, COVID vaccine scheduling and process patient data. The regulations in Germany were very strict that basically said they needed to keep the data in their data center, which in their case was in the hospital. Um, but they needed to be able to quickly build apps and deploy. And so they were able to use satellite to basically get like a private cloud region that happened to run on hardware that was in their hospital. Um, and it comes back a little bit also to the skills comment that I made, like, you know, do you have experts in your team who know how to set up Kubernetes or run OpenShift, who know how to manage Postgres databases and how to secure all that stuff and scale it? Maybe you don't. So being able to have a cloud provider do that for you but you can say it runs on these machines or it runs in this bare metal provider near my ballpark or it runs somewhere else is, is a really nice combination. And I think represents the evolution of where our cloud is going. I do want to bring my co-host back in because they're chomping at the bit here. I want to go to Curtis first. Curtis? Yeah, you know, one of the things when we're talking about all of these various scenarios and the different applications for different use cases and the you know different combinations and permutations of things, what a lot of people want to know is, can it be made simple? I mean, can can I, you know, is, is there a, a recipe for when it's best to do stuff on-prem versus when it's best to do stuff in the cloud? And does such a thing exist or have we reached a point where the possibilities are so vast that there's no way to avoid doing deep analysis and getting deep subject matter experts involved before you can even start to think about how you're going to architect a solution. Yeah, it's a great it's it's a great question. And and I do think it's somewhere in the middle, honestly. Like I, I don't think it can be simplified to the point that it's a very simple pick A, B, or C um, you know, kind of scenario. I think there is a lot of complexity in IT and in the kinds of problems that customers solve. And, and so I don't know that you can make it really simple. However, the other side, the old world, the pre-cloud world was like, you built it all yourself, like pick which servers you wanted and what configurations you wanted and what software stacks. And you were, you were self-assembling the entire world to solve your problems. And so I do think there's a middle here that says there's some common patterns, there's guidance. You know, I, I could take you through kind of a quick decision tree that says answer these questions about security and regulation and policy and, and where your data lives. And I could generally point you in the right direction. And then there's some reusable patterns that say, like, I want to use you know, Kubernetes for applications so that I can abstract across any infrastructure. You know, there's a small menu of things. So I think we can help guide, but I, 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 you know, I'm a pragmatic person. I'm an engineer and, you know, ultimately there are a few questions you got to ask and a little bit of thinking you have to do to be successful. Right. Well, you know, in the, the questions you have to ask category, I, I know in your position, you obviously end up talking to a lot of customers and potential customers about yeah. what they want to do and how they want to do it. Have you run into any common misperceptions, common patterns of thinking that are still wrong in terms of how people should be thinking about the the addition of cloud to on-prem to services yeah i think one of the common um misconceptions which i think is just rooted in 
how fast things are moving is that it's on-prem traditional or public cloud. Like those are my two choices, right? And I'm going to do things in a completely different way, you know? And in fact, I see customers who organize their teams that way, where it's like, I have my on-prem team and I have my cloud team. And I don't think it has to be that either or. I think um, you, you have to think more about um, the applications you're building and not the technologies you're using. Um, and a lot of people haven't caught up to that. Like cloud's a fast moving space. Um, and if you look at how people have adopted clouds, this whole idea that like cloud doesn't have to just live in a cloud data center is only really true in the last two years. Right. And so I think people still have, you know, they're a little farther behind that and they're thinking about how they can apply these technologies to their world. Well, speaking of that cloud living in the cloud, as you, as you say, do you find that people believe or want to ultimately choose a cloud provider and in a significant enterprise, is that possible? Or in the same way that we once would have different flavors of hardware for different use cases within an enterprise, are we looking at a situation where most organizations are going to end up having some level of relationship with multiple cloud providers? I think people would like they would want to pick one. I don't think they will ultimately be successful picking one. Like it, it's always sounds nice to have one. And I think a lot of people started there, honestly. Um, but I don't think it works. And I don't think it works for a number of reasons. I think um, one is just the inevitable evolution of IT and businesses. And you you wind up making different decisions at different parts of your company, or you do acquisitions or partnerships or other things, and you inevitably land with multiple solutions. And two, I think different cloud providers have different strengths and they have different capabilities and people want to be able to take advantage of the strengths and weaknesses of the different providers. You know, in IBM Cloud, we've spent a lot of time on supporting kind of regulated industries like financial services and building in deep controls for security and compliance. So it's really well tuned for those industries. And other cloud providers have focused more on front end applications and have built, you know, uh, productivity and other front end capabilities that are really compelling. So I think the combination of like evolution of business and wanting to take advantage of the latest and greatest strengths from everybody leads people to a multi cloud provider. I think the risk is you do it in a very fragmented way. Like you have to go into it eventually intentionally. You got to decide what's my technology platform? What are the skills I'm building? That, that's why we're so, you know, adamant in IBM that open source is the key foundation for hybrid cloud because we think open source gives you a way to have a common set of technologies that can work in any environment that can span multiple providers and on prem. And so that's how we've built our, our technology stack and our strategy. Oh, okay. I, one, I'm going to say I miss the old IBM mainframe environment. Uh, that's where I grew up, by the way. Anyway, <clears throat> my new You need to miss it, Brian. They're still uh, alive oh, yeah. and well and growing. Yeah. Um, well, one of the things that is changing in the hybrid environment, and I'm seeing the IoT world driving a lot of it. In fact, one of the last thing, last big briefings I got uh, was from AT&T before I retired at the University of Hawaii. And that's how the hybrid cloud is now hybridizing, I guess is a good word, uh, closer to the um, dev mobile devices. Um, in fact, sure. AT&T was actually offering um, microservices at the APN which I yep. thought was pretty cool. Now, yep. so here's here's the real question. I'm asking you to crystal ball this a little bit. Um, is this going to have a big impact? And I'd like you to speculate a little bit on what, what the world's gonna look like for the IoT, especially IoT in the coming years. Yeah, I think it's already having a big impact. In these examples I've been talking through, you're already seeing them like cloud, and cloud technology is pushing closer and closer to the edge, like getting all the way to the device, I think absolutely will happen from the standpoint of like the base technologies like containers and Kubernetes and OpenShift. You're already seeing start to show up in restaurants and cars and devices. 
Um, but even more kind of full cloud services, like we've done a bunch of work with at t and other telco providers to let customers land workloads in the 5G network edge. So you could actually run the workload right where the network comes in. So all those sensors you have in the field can, you know, you, we can quickly process and filter that data. So I really think you're seeing um, cloud uh, as an operating model take over the whole landscape of IT and become the way that we consume IT across all these environments. I think AI, um, whether it's generative AI models or more traditional ML is also a driver of, you know, being able to process that data, do inferencing at the edge and like take IOT data and actually run it through models before you filter that huge data stream back to your central, you know, databases or whatever. I think all those forces are converging to um, really unify how people consume IT technologies across all these different environments. So here's one of my predictions, and I'm predicting that we're going to someday see um, kind of a gen, uh, distributed AI world where light pre-processing is done at the edge, but fed to a back end. That's sure. actually one, a grant proposal I actually sent to IBM to use Watson uh, mm -hmm. for my undersea observatory. So are you starting to see some tools to do this? Because right now it's very cumbersome to split up the models. Yes, um, there are there are absolutely tools um, in, in use now and evolutions of those tools to enable that. I mean, um, and, and in fact, there's real world deployments of architectures like that. Like uh, we worked with a customer, a large auto manufacturer who is doing um, paint inspection, video paint inspection in a factory. So like pre-processing all the data, doing model application, like literally on the production line, feeding analytics back, you know, so locally controlling the paint line, like I need to stop the line because we're having defects. And also then aggregating and feeding statistics back to the central sites to say like, what's the, you know, aggregate quality of what we're doing. I mean, there's so many examples emerging um, where those forces are coming together. So. Um, and with AI models in particular, I think what you described is absolutely happening, which is like AI applications are really a collection of models that solve different parts of the problem. And you need to be able to distribute and run those models. Um, in clouds, we talk a lot about infrastructure for AI, like, you know, large GPU supercomputers for doing training and high performance inferencing chips for like running models. But like, think about all the technology that's embedded in mobile devices now for doing the same thing. So you can push those models, you know, all the way to, of course, your phone, but also to other edge devices. Cool. I want to address one thing because we talked a lot about people, people in the chat room are mentioning it too, is the one thing that they're worried about is the fact that hybrid clouds, they can have performance problems. What are some suggestions that you have that you've seen actually organizations approve uh, and make things better from a performance perspective when it comes to hybrid clouds? Yeah, I mean, um, the performance problems usually arise from people consuming, you know, capability in different places without thinking about how things interact, right? And actually, one of the drivers for hybrid cloud like location choice is that performance and latency thing I mentioned. I, I mentioned it in the context of data, but like you also have like what other applications do you talk to? Mm -hmm. um, I also think there's been an interesting, I'll say, evolution in microservice architecture where people are getting smarter about how they break things up so that, you know, you don't do it theoretically, like I'm going to break it into five microservices, but you think about like, what are the collections that work together? So I, I think it's an active part of how you have to make decisions about where you run things. And you do have to understand um, how applications interact. Y you know, if I, if I step back and I look at the 26 years I've been in this space, like the big macro change that I think is happening is we're going from being infrastructure centric. What are the components that make up a solution to being more application centric? What are the workloads that I'm building and running and how do they interact and driving the infrastructure and driving the cloud locations and all of that from the standpoint of the applications that I'm running. And I think the more customers do that, um, the more successful they'll be at leveraging hybrid cloud and, you know, not having performance problems because they didn't put, you know, two things that talk all the time halfway across the world from each other. 
And one of the forcing functions I'm seeing uh, people to move to hybrid cloud is, you know, I work with lots of scenarios where, you know, organizations need their services in government clouds or sovereign clouds in order to be able to maintain yeah. that business, right? They want to be able to scale internationally and they want to, they want to be able to support that. Is, is this just going to be, have to become a norm that the organizations are going to have to figure out how to componentize their services and break things down so that they can also be in a very similar situation, a hybrid scenario so that they can meet the demand of business in that case? I think so, uh, especially if especially if you're a more multinational kind of enterprise where you have to be able to operate in different places. I mean, you you touch on an interesting point, which is I think the regulatory environment, the geopolitical environment, is leading towards I think a more fragmented cloud environment. You know, you know, today there's a, a handful of kind of global cloud providers who operate in every country around the world. I think you're going to see more demands for local geographically bounded clouds, not only in where things run, but then in where the data stored. And in some cases, who operates the cloud, like who are the people who can operate the cloud and who owns the cloud, like all of those dimensions are out there. Um, how it affects people, I think varies a lot by industry and, and by, by company. But I think the general trend is more fragmentation, um, more cloud environments, more of a demand to be able to deploy your solutions in different places that might mean across different providers. And so being prepared for that and building applications to take advantage of hybrid cloud so you have the flexibility to, to land that, I think is going to become increasingly important. And what would you say to an organization that the standard organization, let's say a 10,000 person seat organization, and they look, they want to basically lift and shift their services from, you know, they have some on-prem services, some on-prem data, but they want to make it so that they can move their data to like a, different regions and different locations in the world, even different government clouds. What, what do you say to them to have traditional architectures, ones that want to move into this hybrid space? What, what's, what's a key benefit for them to do that? And, and, and what's really a good guide for them to follow when it comes to that type of thing? I think if they have traditional architectures, you, you have kind of two paths and most people follow a combination of the two paths, you know, depending on which workloads, like one path is you, you try to lift and shift as is. So for example, lots of people have VMware environments on prem and you can lift those VMware environments straight into a cloud provider. Um, and we do a ton of that in IBM cloud. We run a huge VMware environment um, for many customers. The advantage of that to me is like you can get out of that infrastructure and you can put that workload close to the rest of the applications you run in cloud. Um, and so it can be a good step for people to get going on the transformation. But the more powerful transformation is you adopt a new platform and that new platform in our world is Linux and OpenShift and Kubernetes. And by by adopting a new platform, um, you get the flexibility going forward to run those workloads wherever you need to. And so I, I do think it, it's really important for, for companies to think about like, how do they start to transform those traditional architectures into something that can take advantage of this new platform and therefore be open to the flexibility they may need in the future. Okay. okay I'm good. I got to ask IBM has sure. been very big on quantum computing. And so this is yeah. definitely speculation. Um, sure. Are we going to actually see quantum computing in our lifetime as something that's useful or right now, is it just a really cool research project? Um, it is a really cool research project for sure, but yes, we're going to see it be useful. Um, I think time horizon, um, it's not precise, but my guess is in the next five years, um, you'll see production use of quantum systems. Uh, I think it might be five to 10 years before you see that at kind of large scale across the industry, but it's not, you know, 20 years from now or outside of the lifetime of all of us who are working in this industry. Um, and we actually um, not only have a huge research investment in, in quantum and IBM, but we actually run all of that stuff in our cloud and we've made it accessible to everybody. We have a huge fleet of real quantum systems that anyone can consume through cloud and, and, uh, you know, most of the people consuming it today are are learning and experimenting on how quantum might be applied to different problems. Um, but I think we're closer than you realize to um, to getting to scale. And I think that's fundamentally driven by kind of how many qubits we can we can expose in those quantum systems. And we're doing a lot of interesting research on not only how to increase the size of the quantum computers, but how do you link multiples together and how do you partition problems and get to something that you can scale. I like linking multiple systems together and, and uh, 
I think as those problems get solved, you'll see this very rapid increase in capability uh, around quantum. All right. So let's go and appeal to <clears throat> the parents. There's obviously a shortage of crypto specialists, shortage of security specialists and so forth. If you could go and give advice to kids in say middle school, high school, what are the things that are missing from the people entering the job market now and that IBM or you have had to invest in fixing, you know, plugging the holes, so to speak. I'll, I'll take it from, from two angles. Um, one angle is on the pure technology. I mean, this isn't going to be surprising, but the, the impact of AI is just beginning. And I think skills in that space need to be much more pervasive. It's still a very specialized skill. Um, and I don't think there's any part of technology that isn't going to be massively impacted by, um, by a variety of AI uh, developments. So I think that's a skill base, you know, people need to start to develop and, and, uh, will prove to be very valuable in the coming years. Um, I think the other skill that's missing is, um, being able to actually think about the connection between technology and, and business and product. Like I'm a product guy fundamentally, like I've spent my whole career building products that people can use. And I find a lot of, uh, a lot of technical uh, people coming into the industry, a lot of engineers are good in a deep technology domain, but are not as good at how do all the pieces link together and how do you think as a system and do systems engineering and how do people consume what you're using? And I think, you know, given how technology is evolving, a lot of kind of new technology will actually be how do you assemble different pieces together and how do you link different capabilities? So, you know, having more of a product mindset and having more of a systems engineering mindset, I think will prove valuable. And it's something that's hard you know, people coming in, you know, they're, they're great at, you know, certain technologies, but they're not as good at kind of linking the whole view together. Unfortunately, time flies when you're having fun. We've, we've exhausted all of our time, unfortunately. Jason, thank you so much for being here. But since we're running on low on time, I want to give you a chance to maybe tell the folks at home where they can learn more about IBM cloud, where can they get started? Where can they learn more about hybrid? Sure. I mean, simple place would be IBM.com slash cloud. Um, and, uh, and all the kind of topics we touched on are there and, and you can learn more about, you know, the space in general. And of course, what we're doing at IBM in that space. Well, folks, you have done it again. You sat through another out of the best day enterprise and IT podcast in the universe. So definitely tune your podcatcher to Twyat. I want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially to my amazing co host starting at the very own Mr. Curtis Franklin. Curtis, you teased us before. We got to know what's going on in the coming weeks. Well, I've got a lot of writing that I'm doing, not only for our subscribers at Omnia, but uh, things that are going to be showing up on dark reading. I have one that will be out next week looking at issues around free training packages. Just how far can free training take you? You might be surprised at the answer. So that's one of the things I'm going to be doing. going to be doing a lot of writing about the conferences coming up. Um, and I'm hoping to get some deep thought in while on vacation. Uh, see about coming up with some, some more ideas. Lots of things happening this summer and we're gonna be roaring into the fall. So I hope people will keep up with me on the social media. I'm still on Twitter, KG4GWA. I'm on Mastodon, KG4GWA at sdf.mastodon.org. You can always find me on LinkedIn, Curtis Franklin. Uh, Follow me on Facebook. Uh, I accept carrier pigeons. You know, what, whatever comes across, I'm game. So I look always look forward to having conversations with members of the Twyatt Riot. Thanks, Curtis. We also have to thank our very Mr. Brian G. Brian, thank you so much for being here. What's going on for you in the coming weeks? Where can people find you and get in touch with you? Well, I want to do a shout out, though. One of my big frustrations is some of my instruments that I'm retired with, uh, the battery packs are going bad and some of the gears end of life, you know, especially my fluke test equipment. This is really frustrating, especially since I can't buy them anymore. Um, so the shout out is to a company called MTO Batteries. Um, they will actually take 
old battery packs from end of life gear, you send it to them, they'll rebuild it and then send it back to you. So if I, so like for instance, my Fluke OTDR, if I could buy a new battery pack, it would cost me almost a thousand dollars because they are so rare now. However, MTO battery is offered to rebuild it for $150. Well worth it. And uh, life could get interesting. So I'm going to be telling people whether or not the rebuild was worth it or not, uh, mostly on Twitter. Um, my Twitter address is ADV, N-E-T-L-A-B, Advanced Net Lab. Would love to hear your ideas. And uh, if people have actually found other battery rebuilding places, I'd love to hear about it. Um, yes, I do know how to build battery packs from scratch, but I'd like someone to that has experience to do it, especially on things like lithium batteries that have this little burny te- uh, tendency if you do them wrong. Um, you're also welcome. Uh, I'd love to hear your show ideas, especially since we try to do threads within our um, scheduling. Um, I'm Chebert, spelled C-H-E-E-B-E-R-T at twit.tv, or you're welcome to also use twiet at twit.tv, and that'll hit all the hosts. Uh, look forward to hearing from you. Look forward to hearing your show ideas. And um, would love to see you people at Infocom if you happen to be there. Thank you, Chibert. Well, we also have to thank you as well. You're the person who drops in each and every week to get your enterprise goodness. We want to make it easy for you to watch and listen and catch up on your enterprise and IT news. So go to our show page right now. That's Twit tv slash twy there it is you'll find all the amazing back episodes the show notes the co-host information and the guest information and of course the links of the stories that we do during the show but more importantly there next to those videos you'll get those helpful subscribe and download links there they are and you know get the get the video choice your video version of your choice your audio version of your choice whichever listen on any one of your devices because we're on all, all your podcast applications so definitely subscribe enjoy the show and watch us and listen to us each and every week. Plus, you know, we also have a great way to to listen to all of our podcasts ad-free. That's right, ad-free Club Twit. Have you heard of that? Well, it's a members-only ad-free podcast service with a bonus Twit Plus feed that you can't get anywhere else. It's only $7 a month. That's right. There's a ton of great things that come with it, but one of them is exclusive access to a members-only Discord server. And there you can chat with hosts, producers you can chat during the show separate discussion channels in there there's a ton of them i'll tell you there's even a cooking channel and they also have special events that's right lots of fun things and discussions going on right there so definitely join club twit be part of the movement go twit.tv slash club twit now club twit also offers corporate group plans that's right a great way to give access to your entire team whether it's for our ad your ad free tech podcast out there and the plans start at five members and that discounted rate of $6 each per month. And you can add as many seats as you like after that. And it's a really great way for your sales people, your IT departments, your developers, your tech teams to really stay up to date with access to all of our podcasts. And just like that regular membership, you can join the Discord server and get that Twit Plus bonus feed as well. So definitely have them join and be part of that fun. Plus, get this, you can also have a family plan as well. That's right, $12 a month and you get two seats with that. At six dollars for each additional seat after that and they get all the advantages of the single plan as well so you get a lot of options definitely check out club twit twit.tv slash club twit now after you subscribe you can impress your family members your coworkers, your friends with the gift of twy because we talk about some fun tech topics on the show and i can guarantee they will find them fun and interesting as well so have them join and be part of the movement and also subscribe now if you've already subscribed hey we do this show live we're doing it live right now 1 30 p.m pacific time fridays just go to live.twit.tv there you'll get to choose any one of the streams that we have there you can come see how the pizza's made all the behind the scenes all the fun and banter that we do before and after the show you watch us make all of our mistakes. It's pretty funny. So definitely check out the live stream. Of course, you can also listen and be part of the infamous IRC channel as well, Twit, Twit Live's channel in there. Just go to irc.twit.tv on your browser and you can join the channel right away. And there's a lot of amazing characters in there. Each and every week, they get me laughing. They have some amazing show titles they're already given to us. So thank you for all your support, guys. Each and every week, we love you having having you there, and you know what? We're gonna love you, have you, and have love having you there as well. So definitely, please join in the chat room when you watch the show live. Definitely hit me up. I want to hear from you. Twitter.com/slash/luamm. There, I I post all my tidbits, 
I have conversations, lots of direct messages there. So please hit me up there. Of course, I'm also on Mastodon. You can get me at LouMM at twit.social. Of course, I have a lot of messages on there that I still have to go through. So I apologize if you're waiting on one. So I'll try to get through them this weekend. Plus, I also have lots of great conversations on LinkedIn. I'm Lewis Bresca on LinkedIn. Please check me out there. I'll post some, some articles there and as well as some, some videos. So please check that out. And of course, I also want to show you what I do during my normal work week at Microsoft. Check out developers.microsoft.com slash office. There we post all the latest and greatest ways for you to customize your office experience. And in fact, if you have M Microsoft 365, M365, and you got Excel, open Excel right now, check out the Automate tab. That is my home that I've been living. We built Automate, Power Automate integrations to Excel, letting you record your macros right there, edit the scripts, and let you Power Automate them to schedule them or run them as triggers. Lots of fun stuff. So check that out. It actually is a really powerful tool. So that's developers.microsoft.com slash office. I want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially to Leo and Lisa. They continue to support this week at Enterprise Tech each and every week. And we couldn't do the show without them. So thank you for all your support over the years. And I also want to thank all the staff and engineers at Twit. And of course, I also want to thank Mr. Brian Chi one more time. He's not only our co-host, but he's also our tireless producer. He does all the show bookings and the plannings for the show. And we really couldn't do the show without him. So thank you, Chibert, for all your support. And before we sign out, I want to thank our editor for today, whoever that is, because they make us look great after the fact. So I also want to thank Mr. Victor, uh, who's our TD for today. Victor, are you the editor for today too? Yeah, I'm, I'm the editor also. You're the man for today. You're going to get rid of all, our, of all of our junk. So thank you for doing that. I appreciate it. <laughs> but you know what? If you want to know what's going on, definitely check out all of our Twitch streams. And until next time, I'm Louis Moresco, just reminding you, if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep quiet. Hey there, Scott Wilkinson here. In case you hadn't heard, Home Theater Geeks is back. Each week, I bring you the latest audio video news, tips and tricks to get the most out of your AV system, product reviews, and more. You can enjoy Home Theater Geeks only if you're a member of Club Twit, which costs seven bucks a month. Or you can subscribe to Home Theater Geeks by itself for only $2.99 a month. I hope you'll join me for a weekly dose of Home Theater Geekitude.